Well, I don't like to answer those trivia questions because if you get it wrong, I look stupid. And uh, I knew well, I knew they were on the boat 150 days. I don't know why I said 120 days, but anyway, well, that's good. You guys are doing good, and uh, so uh, we'll go get involved in Bible trivia and get ready for camp. And uh, you know, our goal we'd like to see. Uh, I want you to pray with us about this. We'd like to see a hundred kids from our church go to camp this year. A hundred kids church camp. Church camp, uh, that's our goal. That's our goal. We may not make that, but that's our goal. And uh, church camp changes lives. It's a memorable time. Uh, your life will never be the same. Your memories will never be the same. Uh, church camp is a, uh, devil kind of like to try to get you, uh, you know, he'll do things like he'll give you a summer job you can't get out of. And, and I'm all for working. Don't get me wrong. I love work. Uh, I believe people ought to work hard. And the fellas look up at me back here. I think we ought to work hard. But here's the thing to remember. Here's the thing to remember. You have the rest of your life to work, but you don't have the rest of your life to do the things that you have the opportunity to do now. That's right. And uh, so you say, how do I do that? I want to get a job for the summer. Just when you go in, go and tell them going in. Just say, uh, man, I'd love to work here, but I've, I've got an obligation for this week here. And in most cases, in most cases, they will work with you. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's what we found in most cases. And, um, uh, but you don't have every opportunity to go to church camp, especially some of you guys older ones. And, um, uh, and it's just a great, uh, a great opportunity. I'd like to see 100 kids. And uh, we've, got, uh, we've got scholarships for camp this year and everything. So uh, we, uh, we, it can, you want to go, it can happen. I don't want you to go. I want you to be there. And um, uh, Brother Randy Dignan is going to, how many ever, does anybody remember Brother Randy Dignan coming to our church in the summertime? Man, alive. Isn't that amazing? And uh, I've, uh, I've been working on my cartwheels. It just won't work. I don't know how he does it. And uh, so, uh, but... Uh, Anyway, that's uh, that is uh, that's fantastic. And, uh, have y'all ever heard about the uh, the label warnings? The label warnings. Y'all heard about that? Here's some of the label warnings. One line product warnings. You know, when you go buy a buy an item and you pull out the the uh, the manual, it's got warnings and things. And uh, uh, and so uh, uh, these are some of the one line warnings. Literally, uh, they say these are real deals. And, uh, and I've seen some funny ones in my lifetime, but nothing like this. There's a blanket made in Taiwan that said, do not, this blanket is not to be used as a protection from a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> On an electric drill sold at Home Depot, this product not intended for use as a dental drill. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it. Yeah. On a hair dryer, do not use in shower. <laughs> Silly putty, not to be used for earplugs. <laughs> an iron, an iron, never iron clothes while they are being worn. <laughs> I see you ever tried to iron your clothes and you wear them? <laughs> oh, that's weird. I actually tried that once. It wasn't a pretty sight. So I guess people like me have got to hear that. The old days, the old days, all right, uh, you know, now when you put on deodorant, you just kind of do that number, but that's not the way it used to be in the old days, all right, so you'll have to understand all the time, but underarm deodorant, do not spray in eyes, all right, do not spray in eyes, how many remember spray deodorant, Shh. anybody, ever, anybody use spray deodorant, you do, oh, some do, all right, so it's still around, okay, good, and, uh, all right, that's good, um, a cardboard da a cardboard dashboard sunshield. You know how people put it in their, their front windows? Do not drive with sunshield in place. <laughs> <laughs> this was on a chainsaw, in the manual of a chainsaw. Do not attempt to stop the blade with your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all heard me tell the story about the grandma. If you don't haven't heard me, if you have heard it, you just laugh. But you heard me tell. She went to a Bible study, and uh, uh, there was uh, uh, some Bible verses being learned, and one of the verses they learned was Acts two thirty eight you know, about repent, be baptized, and all of that. And uh, and when Peter was up preaching Acts two thirty eight, 
Well, then she come home and uh, uh, she uh, came into the house and discovered somebody had broken into her house. As she was about to make her way to the phone, she heard a noise and discovered whoever broke into the house is still there. She was pet, she froze, she stopped. She didn't know what to do. She could hear somebody going through her things. All she could remember is the Bible verse she learned in the Bible study, Acts 2.38. That's all she could think of. She had one of those old houses that were built up that if you hit the floor, it would echo throughout the whole floor. And that's what she did. She hit the floor as hard as she could. She stomped and she shouted, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38. Dead silence. She eased over the phone, dialed 911. The police came. Sure enough, they came in the house. And there was the burglar in a room with things in his hand and things in his bag. They arrested him. They put him in handcuffs. They interviewed the elderly lady. They went through all the house, find out what was there and all that. So finally, the investigator, after all that process was over, this guy was sitting in the back of the patrol car, handcuffed, and uh, he walks to the car and he says, can I ask you a question? I just got to ask you this. This was a little elderly lady. Why didn't you at least run? And he said, man, that woman had an ax and two thirty eights. I wasn't going <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Hosea chapter 10. Stand with me for the reading of God's word. Hosea chapter 10. <laughs> Hosea chapter 10. I want to read two verses to you this morning. Can you hear me okay? Can y'all hear me in the back? Hosea chapter 10. Verse number 12. In fact, I'd like for us to read this text together. Hosea. Maybe a little harder to find. It's in the Old Testament. Find Isaiah. He turned to the right. You've got to look at the front of your Bible and find the page number. That's okay. I had to do that for years. All right, Hosea chapter 10. Find it. Who's still looking for it? It's in there, I promise. It's there. Find Isaiah and keep turning to the right. Find Isaiah, keep Isaiah, Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Daniel, and keep turning to the right. Hosea. Huh? It's after Daniel. You'll find it, it's there. All right. If you're looking at it, let's read verse 12 and 13 together. Are you ready? Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness. Ye have reaped iniquity. Ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst church in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Verse number 12 says it's time to do something. What does it say in verse 12 it's time to do? Seek the Lord. It's time to what? Seek the Lord. It's time to what? Seek, Seek the Lord. Let's talk about that just a little bit. Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. Bless this chapel. Thank you for these students, Lord, whom we love with all of our hearts. And uh, so proud of them. Bless today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a lot of people neglecting God. A lot of teenagers neglecting God. There's worlds neglecting God. Nations neglecting God. One of the dumbest thing a person can do in their life is to neglect God. When you neglect God, there's only one place to turn, and that's yourself. you got to depend upon yourself. you got to trust yourself. you got to take care of yourself. That's what people who neglect God do. You are your only hope when you neglect God. But the Bible tells us that it is time to seek the Lord. He talks. He uses a farming uh, illustration and uh, if you've ever watched, the, uh, uh, watched uh, the old, old time farmers, how they would still plow with mules. And he, he says, sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your uh, fallow ground. They would come in there and they would dig up that ground and they would turn that dirt and uh, try to get it to where it could grow something if it was planted. They got to break it up. Ground gets hardened. Ground gets hardened. So does our heart. And when he uses that illustration, he said, you've got to break up your heart. You've got to turn your heart. If you're not careful, your heart will get hardened. 
and, uh, uh, and you've got to break it up. That's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to break up that. And he says, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. The Lord is Jehovah God. That's what that means. Lord, Jehovah God, the existing one. Stop acting like he doesn't exist. He is that existing one. Because without God, there is no life. In the beginning, God created. If God did not create you, you would not be here. So why in the world would you be a created being and act like God is not the existing one? That's kind of what he's trying to say. So he says, break up that fallow ground, that heart of yours that has become hardened and unproductive. He says, run a plow over that thing. Turn that dirt. And uh, you ever seen how, uh, you ever got, uh, dug, dug a hole here in Florida and it's all that hard, gray looking, ugly stuff and you dig it, but then you dig down a little bit and you get into some of that black dirt, right? And, uh, and so that's what he's talking about. He says, break that thing up and get some good dirt there. And so as we think about this, he says, it is time to seek the Lord. God exists. May I say to you, young men, young women, right now is the time to seek the Lord. You do not have time to put it off. The longer a person puts off seeking the Lord, the harder their heart becomes. Picture Pharaoh with a hardened heart. And so as we think about this, seeking the Lord, it's an amazing thing. And uh, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, I want you to notice a person will reap what they sow. A person will reap what they sow. Say that with me. A person will reap what they sow. I will reap what I sow. You will reap what you sow. Whatever you plant, that is what you will get. If you plant nothing, you get nothing. If you plant sin, you get sin. And, uh, uh, and so uh, whatever uh, we plant, that is what we get. And uh, uh, you neglect God, you're going to get a life that results neglecting God. Look at, uh, look at the Bible. Look at verse 12. He says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. To sow means to plant. To reap means something grows. How many ever planted a seed? How many ever, well, ever had something grow from what you planted? All right? So you understand this concept. You plant. God says, if you sow righteousness, you're going to reap mercy. Now, flip back to chapter 8 for just a moment and look with me at verse number 7. Watch what God says. Chapter 8 and verse 7. Because he talks about this through the whole book of Hosea. He says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath, uh, it hath no stall. The bud shall yield no meal. For if so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. But notice he says they sown the wind and reap the whirlwind. You live in Florida, you know what a whirlwind is. What is a whirlwind? What kind of season are we about to enter into? What can we get this summer that knocks out electricity and knocks out the water and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that hurricane comes? Now, God uses the illustration. He says, well, what you sow will come back magnificent. If you sow righteousness, you will get magnificent mercy. If you sow so sin, you will get magnificent results in the area of sin, meaning you'll get more punishment than you can bargain for. Because God says this, if you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. You put some wind in the ground, it's going to come back as a hurricane. That's what God says. Nobody can handle sin. Nobody can handle iniquity. We reap what we sow. And so as we think about this, and, uh, and what happens if we're not careful, we start uh, playing the blame game. Well, I sowed sin, and life came back and exploded in my face, and uh, it all fell apart. It must be my parents' fault. It must be my pastor's fault. It must be the school's fault. It must be uh, society's fault. It's somebody's fault. It's the neighbor's fault. It's the president's fault. No. If you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. If you're reaping the whirlwind, it's your fault for sowing the wind. You understand what I'm saying? The bottom line is we have to wake up and take responsibility for our life. God says 
What you plant is exactly what you're going to get. We reap what we sow. If we want God's blessings, we must sow righteousness. We've got to do right. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. says, do right, do right, do right, though the stars fall, do right. Meaning we always do right. There is never a reason to do wrong. There is never an excuse to do wrong. Because when we do wrong, we plant wrong, and we will explode with the results of wrong. And so a person will reap what they sow. Number two, it is our responsibility to come to God. Our responsibility. Whose responsibility is it? God says it's time to seek the Lord. That word seek, he says, it's your responsibility. I'm here, but it's your responsibility to seek me. It is time to seek the Lord. Well, preacher, I just pray for me now. I've heard this once. I've heard it a thousand times. Pray for me now. I, 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 you know, me and the Lord, we, I, I, I've got no problem with the Lord. I, I just, I haven't found him yet. I'm not looking very hard because God's easy to find. One of these days I'm going to find him. The problem is you're not promised tomorrow. God said it is time to seek the Lord. It is our responsibility. God is always there. The Bible says in James 4, 8, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. Person pulls up over here out in the parking lot. People stop in asking directions. And they, hey, uh, is there a Highway 41 around here anywhere? Now let me ask you a question. Who's lost? Highway 41 or them? They're lost. And they give them directions, go over there, and it's his job to seek it. But the bottom line is, God is not lost. We are. If you've not found the Lord yet, and, and, and he is evident, the moment an individual seeks God, God is there. It's amazing how Cornelius woke up one morning. He was under conviction. He was a very wealthy man, and, and uh, uh, man, something hit. I think he heard a sermon is what I think. He was the first Gentile of any uh, 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 that uh, Peter ever led to Christ. But he woke up one day under conviction. He realized, man, I'm lost and on my way to hell. He was under so much conviction, he couldn't eat. Think about that. He was under so much conviction, he couldn't eat. One day went by, two days went by, three days went by. He couldn't eat. Finally, he heard about a preacher by the name of Peter. And an angel actually came to him and says, call for this thing, for this one Peter. And so he obeyed that and he sent for Peter and Peter came and he said, man, I'm under so much conviction, I can't eat and I want to know God. And Peter gave him the gospel and he got saved. It was time for Cornelius to seek the Lord. It's time for you to seek the Lord. It's time for me to seek the Lord. It's time now. And it's our responsibility. God's already there. God has not moved. If you're away from God, it's because you've done the moving. It's not because God's done the moving. God will not move. His place is solid. He is always there for you. But I want to tell you something. The Bible gives us indication that God will not be treated like a spare tire. A spare tire is, you never think about it until you have a flat tire. You pull it out and stick it on. God said, I've called and 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 called. He told the children of Israel. And finally, when they got in trouble, he said, forget this. No way. You're not going to treat me like a spare tire. And so we need to understand something. That's why God says, now is the time to seek the Lord. A person will reap what they sow. It's our responsibility to seek him. God says, sow yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your foul ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. It's time right now. Number three, as we think about this, now here's what happens in our mind. All right, preacher, I see this verse. I hear your message. I hear your passion. I understand and I'm going to seek the Lord right after graduation. I'm going to seek the Lord in a few days. I'm going to seek the Lord sometime before I get married. I'm going to seek the Lord maybe when I start having children. Now, what did God say? When did God say it's time to seek the Lord? Now. Now. What does now mean? Now. What's now mean? 
What does now mean? Now. What does now mean? Yeah. Right. This second. Not after lunch. Not at the end of the day. Not on Sunday. Now. Now. Now is the time to seek the Lord. Too many people wait. Hell is full of people that waited. The devil wants people to wait. The devil says, that's okay. I don't mind you having plans on seeking the Lord. Just don't do it right now. Now, I can't seek the Lord right now, preacher, because I'm, I'm planning on sinning on Friday night. I got sin plans on Friday night. I got sin plans tonight. I got sin plans this weekend. I can't seek the Lord. Maybe on Monday. Let me get that sin out of the way, and then maybe I'll do it on Monday. That's why you need to turn your phone off the chapel. That's why you need to turn your phone in when you come into school. As we think about this and understand, and uh, I, I, I just can't do it now. God says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. If you're not saved, you need to get saved now. You don't put it off to the next hour. It's amazing how many times God talks about an hour in the Bible. The hour of, the hour of. You don't put it off to the next hour. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. God tells us that you are responsible for your decisions for the Lord the moment you know what his will is. The moment you hear what his will is, God holds us accountable to now. Here's a teenager. He hears he's supposed to seek the Lord now. He decides or she decides, I'm going to put it off and I'm going to wait. And wait never comes. It just never comes. It never comes. It never comes. It just never happens. When they stand before God, they will be held accountable for the moment they knew that truth. At that now moment. I have a preacher I love to listen to his sermons. His, number, his name is W.A. Criswell. He's in heaven now, but I listen to, I don't know, three, four, five sermons a week. Just like to hear him preach. He told a story about a, about a, a uh, man in his church that uh, tried to reach one of his kids. He said, would you go visit? And they went and visit, and they were there in the home. And, and uh, they made this statement. We're very close, very close. To becoming Christian, getting in church and serving the Lord. We're almost there. And Dr. Criswell said, if anybody was telling me the truth in genuine, that family was genuine. And he said, but Sunday came and they never came. The next Sunday, they wasn't there. The next Sunday, they wasn't there. Time went on and time went on and time went on. Finally, about 2.30 in the morning, I got a phone call. That family's little boy had ran out of the house and somehow got in the road and was hit by a car. He was rushed to the hospital and the nurse said, Dr. Quiswell, this family is calling for you. Would you come and have prayer with them? Their little boy had died. He said, I jumped up done that many times myself, ran to the hospital, met the family, said we had prayer together. He said one of the hardest things I could watch is watch the life of that little boy leave him. He said I watched that father literally say I let my son die without ever showing him how to live right. He said, never heard that before. I had the opportunity to be a good example and I just didn't Screamed it at him. He fell to the side of the bed and wept over the body of that little boy. But I attended the funeral. I did the funeral. Very sad funeral. Watch that family sit around, stand around the gravesite. But ironically, the next Sunday, the whole family was at church. And he said, normally, when a family comes down the aisle, I rejoice. He said, I had a hard time rejoicing this time. Because he said, I watched that family. And the rest of the church didn't know the whole story like I knew. But I watched that family come down the aisle. 
Every single living family member came down the aisle. But he said it was so sad because there was one of them missing. And that father told me, he said, I reaped, I sowed the wind, but I reaped the world. God had to get my attention. He said, I don't believe if I would have sought the Lord when I was supposed to, my little boy would be gone. Now, I'm not trying to say that God's going to take away a life. God can, God does, God's in charge of all that, but the point I'm making is, is that now is the time. When we know we're supposed to do something right now, and we say tomorrow. You remember Pharaoh? Remember the plague of the frogs? Frogs everywhere. How would you like to get up tomorrow morning and find frogs in your drawer? Frogs in the cupboard, frogs in the refrigerator. You open up the box of cereal and a frog jumps in. You open up the milk container and pour the milk in. There's a frog swimming. Frogs were everywhere. They were in the oven. They were in the bathroom. They took showers with frogs. Frogs everywhere. That's what the Bible said. It's literally, they were overrun with frogs. They'd be sleeping for days. Frogs crawling in the bed. You wake up in the morning and it kind of tastes froggy. <laughs> Frog legs are on the menu, brother. <laughs> Finally, Pharaoh says, I've had enough. Get Moses in here. Get rid of these frogs. Ask God to move them. Okay, Moses says, I'll go to God and I'll pray. When? Moses said, when do you want me to pray? I, I don't get it. Pharaoh was dealing with the frogs. His whole household was dealing with the frogs. Do you remember what Pharaoh's answer was? Tomorrow. Frogs are literally making everyone's life miserable. And Pharaoh says tomorrow. One more night with the frogs. What is it about sin that we're afraid to get rid of? One more night. I'll do it tomorrow. That's the devil's plan. It's okay to seek the Lord as long as it's tomorrow. Tomorrow. Anybody ever seen a little Christmas cartoon called Annabelle's Wish? Can't use that illustration. Never seen it. The Bible says we reap what we sow. It's our responsibility to come to God, and the time to seek the Lord is now. Got to seek him tonight. Now, not tomorrow. Number, number four. If we neglect seeking the Lord, we are gambling with our tomorrow. If we neglect to seek the Lord today, we are gambling with our tomorrow. The Bible says in, in chapter 9 and verse 17 of Hosea, My God will cast them away because they did not hearken unto him. And they shall be wanderers among the nations. God says, I'll cast you away. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, to not neglect so great a salvation. If you're lost and you need to be saved, you don't need to gamble with your eternity. There was a young couple that was sitting in a church in North Carolina. The preacher was preaching the gospel. And he could tell they were very disrespectful. You ever seen somebody in church just disrespectful? I mean, you know, they're just talking all the way through it and not cutting and cutting up and, and, and just disturbing people. That's what they were doing, two young adults in their early 20s. They were just really disrespectful to the church, to the Bible, to God, to the preacher preaching. That's just what they were doing. And the preacher made the comment, he said, don't gamble with your soul. About that time, they got up and walked out of the church service, almost right before it ended. People saw them get up and leave. They went out the back door, got into a Volkswagen, 
and drove about six blocks away. Just as people were coming out of church, they heard the awfulest screeching of tires, the crunching of metal. It wasn't long after that, they heard sirens. Some of the people in the church passed by the scene. They ran through an intersection and a tractor trailer ran over that Volkswagen. Killed them both instantly. You know how people will in the church after the church service if you've ever seen them do it some of y'all have done it and i thank you for it but they they go down the uh down the pews putting hymn books back picking up pieces of paper and all that kind of stuff you ever seen people do that well there was a man doing that in the church service and he walked by the pew where that young couple was sitting they found an offering envelope true story stuck up in the the hymn book rack he pulled it out, and this is what it said. I'm willing to gamble. How about you? And then in another handwriting, in another color ink, it said, I'm game. Let's get out of here. Six blocks away, they went into eternity. If you neglect seeking the Lord today, you're gambling with tomorrow. How do I seek the Lord, preacher? Well, the Bible is very, very specific here. Look at verse 12, if you would. Hosea chapter 10 with me again. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. He says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Now, God's got a, God's got a, a promise here. That if you seek the Lord, he's going to rain blessings on your life. There is nothing you can do yourself to make life like what God will make it for you. But everything is wrapped up in this little word, seek. How do I seek the Lord? Well, number one, if you're not saved, you need to open up your heart to Jesus. You may be in a Christian school, you come to church, but it doesn't mean you're saved. Listen, I went to church lost. I started going to church when I was eight years old. I went forward, but I don't remember anything that happened. And, uh, uh, and, and I remember getting baptized, but I don't remember really making a decision for Jesus Christ. I just remember going and going forward with my dad. And so if you don't know you're saved, you need to make sure you're saved. That's how you seek the Lord. Number one, you make sure you're saved. Number two, after you make sure you're saved, if you're not. Now, if you know you're saved, praise the Lord. But after you know that you're saved and you are set for eternity and you're going to heaven. The second thing that we need to do is we need to plant righteousness in our life. What that means is we just simply do right. We plant righteousness. We sow righteousness. God says if we sow righteousness, it's going to rain back righteousness. Think about the rain. God doesn't send sprinkles. The Bible says that he rains. The word rains means an outpour. And, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, these monsoon rains, these torrential rains, God says, I will rain righteousness back. So if we sow righteousness, uh, we'll not only reap mercy, but he said, I'm going to rain righteousness back on you. All of the blessings, listen to me carefully. Every time you obey God, it comes with a blessing. Every time you disobey God, it comes with a curse. Every single time. And so I want you to picture planting a garden. You walk through life. You get up every day and you do right. You plant your seed. You just plant. You did right. Told the truth. Doing what I'm supposed to do. Read my Bible. I prayed. I went to church. I was involved in this. I, 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 I followed the leading of the Holy Spirit. Every time you do that, you're just, you're just planting. You're planting righteousness. And God says, he uses the illustration, God says not only will it grow up merciful, you'll get God's mercy as it grows up, but God says, I'll also do something else. I'll send rain of righteousness on you. In other words, God says, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And he links that, he uses that illustration with tithing, but this is what he, it's kind of the same illustration, it'll rain righteousness on you. And so we just, we just keep playing, keep playing. Every time you tell a lie, though, you're also planting. Every time you skip church, you're planting. Every time you disobey God, you're planting. So remember that. So we make sure we're saved. 
We, we plant righteousness. We plant it. That's how we seek the Lord. I want to encourage you. Seeking the Lord starts. God says to seek him early. And there's a twofold application there. Some people say it means early in life. And some people means it means seek early in the day. And I agree with both. We seek him early in life. But we also seek him early in the day. I want to challenge you. If you didn't do it today, start tomorrow, get up in the morning and seek the Lord. That means get out of bed in time to read your Bible. I want to issue a challenge. Grab your, grab your Bible before you grab your phone. Grab your Bible before you grab your phone. Open up the scriptures and read it before you ever send a text. Before you ever look up anything. Grab your Bible. Seek the Lord before you grab your phone. Get God in your mind for the day. And that will help you plant righteousness all day long. This is what we need. We need to be saved. We need to seek the Lord. You need to rededicate your life. You need to do that. You need to get busy in church. Do whatever. But man, I tell you, it's time. Because God says it is time to seek the Lord. God's watching. God's working. God wants to use you, and I will tell you something. God wants to rain righteousness on your life. It is time to seek the Lord. Do I eat it now? Let's pray together. Would you stand? Father, I want to ask you that you would please help us today to seek the